Welcome to a brief introduction to architectural structures, taking the point of view of that thought process being part of the larger architectural design thinking. This is an introduction to structures to be presented in ARC 162. We certainly know that there are some situations that involve a substantial amount of design thinking or design sensitivity folded in with very sophisticated technical thinking. High-rise buildings are an example where we know the loads from hundreds of floors elevated above the ground are very high and those loads need to be taken, those forces need to be taken very efficiently to the foundations. By the same token, we still have to provide efficient floor space for the occupants of the building and a reasonable and logical layout. We also want to design a building that is aesthetically appealing to people. This is the John Hancock building in Chicago, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. It has a taper to it, which was incorporated to reduce the surface area that's exposed to wind higher up in the building. It also causes the vortices, the wind vortices that are being shed near the top of the building to be of a different size from those at the bottom of the building and therefore of a different frequency. So this taper helps to do something we call confusing the vortices or disorganizing the vortices. And that becomes really crucial because if you have huge vortices that are being shed and the entire wind shedding process has a single frequency to it, if that single frequency matches the natural fundamental frequency of the building, then energy can build up in the building over a series of cycles. So we'd like to avoid that and one of the techniques is to change the cross section of the building as we move vertically up the building so that uh, the frequency of vortex shedding near the top is different from down near the bottom. Another thing that's very sophisticated about this particular building is they're trying to spread the footprint as wide as possible for stability purposes and they're trying to brace it as effectively as possible. So you'll notice the uh, large diagonal braces on this building uh, it was one of the very early examples of what we call a braced or triangulated uh, high-rise tubular structure. This is what this looks like from the ground and you'll notice one of the things they accomplished with this building is by making the building taller they freed up some, sp some land that they devoted to uh, public space. Um, this is all retail at the bottom of this building and then the subterranean area that's depressed has retail and, and restaurants all around it. And that um, area that's recessed down in the ground has this wonderful quality that it picks up less noise from the vehicular traffic. And this is one of the grand urban spaces in Chicago. It's one of those places where you walk down the canyons between these high-rise buildings and you come to this grand open space which seems to invite you in and make you want to linger there. Another example of technology influencing the aesthetic of a building. This is the Hearst Building in New York. The basic concept is that unlike other triangulated two buildings which have some gravity columns which are vertical and then bracing elements which have a slope to them, those bracing elements don't participate in any meaningful way in resisting gravity loads except that they hold the vertical elements vertical so that they will carry the gravity load. So the diagonals in a building like the uh, John Hancock building um, are, are only bracing and they are zero force members under gravity load. So this is an example of a diagrid concept where uh, 
the designers said rather than have some verticals that carry gravity and some diagonals that carry horizontal forces, why don't we slope all the members and connect them together in a way where they all participate in resisting gravity loads and they all participate in resisting horizontal shear forces. So this building claims, and I think probably accurately so, that it saves about 50% of the steel, at least in the perimeter column elements and diagonal elements. And you'll notice that this decision to eliminate all vertical columns in the, in the perimeter portion of the building has a profound impact on the aesthetic because you'll notice these little chunks that are taken out of the corners. That's the net result of saying we're going to have no vertical columns, which means we're going to have no vertical edge there. So technology and functionality and aesthetics are all interacting fairly strongly um, where the primary technology we're talking about at the moment is structural technology. These are some close-ups of that building. You'll notice each of these triangles is four stories high. Um, they chose that to make a very dramatic statement about diagrids. Uh, you can also make the triangles one story high, which is in many ways even more efficient, but also it runs the risk of looking a little busy. So one of the decisions you make in, in defining your structural system and the coarseness of that system has to do with visual effect and aesthetics. And the images on the right here just show some of the complexity of the joints that were used to connect these elements together. And these uh, structural members all got covered over with insulation and cladding, so the final aesthetic um, was quite different from the aesthetic of the building while it was un under construction. Now, we also talked earlier about the John Hancock building and the fact that it was tapered. We can carry this concept of tapering to the ultimate extreme where it tapers to a single point at the top. The John Hancock building in many ways was more practical because every floor had enough floor area to uh, warrant having elevators coming to it and every floor I had enough floor area that could be worked out in some kind of efficient way. This is a Transamerica building in, in San Francisco. It's an incredibly dramatic building which changed the skyline of San Francisco before people who looked for identifying um, markers in the city of San Francisco looked for the bridges and after the Transamerica building was built we all look for the Transamerica building as the identifier of the San Francisco skyline. So, um, as a visual statement, it was very powerful. It also makes a lot of sense in terms of lateral stability uh, and in terms of getting light down to the street. And there are a number of different factors that make it appealing. One thing you'll notice, though, is the floors up above are getting so small that the elevators that are required to service them wouldn't fit within those floor plates. So these odd shoulders or protrusions are actually the elevator shafts uh, going to the top occupied floors in this building. And then this portion from there on up is really not prime real estate. So you'll notice there are no windows in it because the floor plates that would exist there would be too small. Another very dramatic example of this notion of the tapering of the building, which again I remind you we're doing to broaden the base, to reduce wind load on the top of the building, and to um, confuse or disorganize the vortex shedding process so that we'll never get very strong influences stimulating the fundamental frequency of the building. This building had an interesting uh, history also in that a certain portion of the material that got added to the top has no function other than to alter the fundamental frequency of the building. So they're basically detuning the building from any of the natural frequencies that are occurring either in the vortex shedding process or in seismic events. So some of this material actually got added 
to increase the natural frequency, uh, excuse me, the natural period of oscillation to put it somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 seconds so that the movement of the building would never be really dramatic or disturbing to people, but also that's a frequency or a, or a oscillation period that's well outside the normal range of any vortex shedding or any seismic events. This building, by the way, is incredibly simple. It's braced laterally by these huge shear walls, which also flank the uh, corridors. Um, and so these shear walls provide really great fire isolation and fire protection. They set a really big footprint by coming all the way out here and out here and out here. So there's a triangulated footprint or a sort of tripod base. Um, these walls are sometimes called buttresses. So this is the buttressed core concept. This uh, central wall is uh, an enclosed tube which helps resist uh, the tendency for this to buckle torsionally and collapse towards the ground. Uh, so the building cannot twist because of this tubular element. And also these elements are integral with that wall and they also participate in carrying gravity loads and resisting overturning moments. This building is unbelievably simple. Every one of these floors is an eight or nine inch thick slab of concrete, which is just the right thickness to span from that wall to that wall. And it's thick enough to put in all the J traps and all the plumbing so that each floor is a nine inch thick floor, which incorporates all the, all the plumbing and all the electric wiring. And so with the proper finishing of that ceiling, the interstitial volume is literally only nine inches. Um, the other wonderful thing is the load from every one of these slabs gets delivered to that wall and then delivered straight down to the foundation. Those walls are continuous all the way to the footing of the building, which means there are no beams, there are no girders, there's only slab and bearing wall in this structure. It's the reason the structure is so economical to build and so phenomenally efficient that uh, in the 40 years prior to the building of this building, high-rise buildings had nudged up in height by about 22 percent. This building in one single stroke increased the height of the tallest building in the world by 60 percent. 40 years of building produced 22 percent this simple and imaginative structure zoomed that number up by 60%. Historically, we have some grand examples. Um, this is the Eiffel Tower, which was built before 1900 and remains one of the most extraordinary structures in the world. It's unbelievably beautiful. It's unbelievably rational. This shape right here mimics the overturning moment curve so the structure is not just tapering but it's actually getting progressively wider um, as it goes down. Um, Eiffel had an amazingly good sense of, of uh, the nature of the internal forces in a structure like this and this stands as a marvel to this day of an efficient geometry in terms of the distribution of forces. If you ever go to Paris, you should spend a lot of time around the Eiffel Tower. Um, that concept has also been mimicked in some buildings. This is Bank One building in Chicago, uh, which has this curved taper to reflect the internal resisting moment or the overturning moment uh, for this building under wind or seismic effects. Um, sometimes, we go against the grain of structural logic or we we really stretch ourselves in terms of our ability to deal with structures because we're driven by various kinds of architectural um, or environmental factors. This is the uh, City Group Bank building in New York. It's a 64-story tall building 
Uh, it's not a world record height at all. In fact, it's good that it's not because it has undertaken to challenge our structural capabilities in a different direction. This was the location of a church which served the community in this part of Manhattan. The feeling was that it was going to be a hard sell to buy that piece of property and that there would probably be a lot of ill will afterwards if, even if they succeeded in buying it. So the people who were working on this building decided that they were going to try a different strategy which was they were going to notch their building. So this notch right here was to make room for that church. And then they even offered to rebuild the church. So they built a larger and better church and then bought the air rights above the church. So what they've done is they've notched the building back, or if you wish, they've, they've cantilevered it out. But every, all the loads are being brought back from this face to a single column here. And all the loads from this face are being brought back to that column. Now, they actually started off by just notching the building on one side. That was the concept. And then once they figured out that they could do that, then they said, well, why don't we think about whether we want notches anywhere else? And of course, it immediately sprang to their minds that in fact, there was an opportunity on this corner, which might be even greater than the opportunity there, because this was going to pull back from this really busy intersection in Manhattan and provide a public space. So they did that. And that's what the public space looks like, which is their gift to New York City. And by the way, when you give a city a gift like that, your building is going to get fast-tracked and it's going to get much more favorable treatment because every politician in the city of New York is looking to every developer to produce something that's good for the city, not just for the developer. This is a, an aerial view. So this is the redesigned church and that's that public space. And to give you a sense of how old this building is, look at these buildings here. They've all been replaced by things that are 40 or 50 or 60 stories high. So you'll notice there are these four outrigger columns, one on each of the faces, and then there's a shear core here, which handles the horizontal shear forces, but also provides vertical circ circulation to the upper part of the building. As they were thinking about it, they not only created this beautiful space, but it occurred to them that they could notch this corner and then uh, tuck this um, mall into that corner. So every one of these corners is getting used for something that has a very high, either high monetary value or high political value. And this is the interior of that mall, which is a pretty cool little building all in itself. Okay, so we have all these loads which are coming down this building and they're getting uh, collected together in this column and this is the mall we were just talking about and this was the concept that was drawn by William LeMessure who was the engineer on this project in response to a request by the architect to consider the possibility of notching the corners of this building um, and this was his idea was that you could still have a pretty broad base uh, if these columns were brought all the way out to the face, these columns right here. Um, in order to handle this very substantial overhang, he could have put in a gigantic transfer beam here, but he was much more efficient and logical in his thinking. So he's got a series of these struts that collect the loads together. So um, every uh, eight floors is carried by uh, a pair of these struts and the loads get accumulated on the center line. Or here these struts bring the loads to the center line there and of course this column becomes a very very substantial column and then it flares out and becomes larger and is trussed because this column now is very long and very vulnerable to buckling whereas these columns are much shorter and are much better braced. 
But you notice he's taken uh, account of gravity loads, but he's also drawn these diagrams of wind against the face, and he's showing the forces that are necessary to keep this building from toppling over. So we have an increased compression force there and a tension force here that hold the building down. It's a brilliant piece of work from an engineering point of view, but it's always a, also, in my mind, a brilliant piece of urban design. Here's another building that was designed to free up some of the ground plane. Um, this dimension in this direction from right here to there is about 300 feet, and there are about 10 stories in this building. Uh, this was a design that was uh, facilitated by um, Leslie Robertson, who designed the World Trade Center, and a host of other really outstanding engineering creations. In this case, um, this was a bank, a Federal Reserve Bank, which handled huge amounts of money and various uh, um, securities down in this basement. Trucks had to come into that basement. The pattern of activities that was occurring there was extremely irregular. So the decision was made to just span from that tower to that tower using this suspension element. One on each face, and then between the faces were trusses. So this shows the faces of the building from the inside and the trusses spanning about 70 feet across. So each floor was 300 feet by about 70 feet of absolutely column-free space. Um, above the tension member or the suspension member, there were compression members that were handling loads as columns, and they were rendered as wide flange beams or column-like elements. Below the suspension element, these are suspenders or elements acting in tension, and they were rendered as one inch by eight inch plates in order to have the absolute maximum transparency for all the spaces down below that suspension member. To kind of emphasize the relative nature of those things, this is the line of the suspension member. These are some of those compression members up above that are acting as columns. The glass has been pulled back um, to allow us to see the bulk and weight of those compression members and then they've been clad in some fairly deep um, mullions which are intended to further accentuate um, the heavy weight of those things. And then here where we have the slender suspenders, the facade has been brought out to the front and rendered with relatively fine mullions uh, to reflect the fact that that's lighter construction. So this is one view of the building, and here's a view of it off from the side. An extremely dramatic and fascinating building, which has many technological features that we'll get to talk about in our structure class next year. Uh, here's another building that's attempting to do the same kind of thing. Down below here are a series of rails uh, that are leading into one of London's most uh, heavily utilized train stations. Uh, those rails where this site occurs are very irregular. They're curving, they're changing their position in space, and because of the irregular nature of the layout of those rails, it became really difficult to come up with any kind of rational, regular column grid. Uh, aside from that, though, there was a feeling that those columns put the trains at risk, and the trains put the columns at risk and so the decision was made to span from here to there and again it's in the neighborhood of 300 feet it's a city block that's being spanned and it's being spanned by this parabolic arch there's one on each facade and then two more in the core of the building which allows column free construction everywhere down here and in fact, the glazing around the, the um, entry lobby down below doesn't even really quite come down and touch the pavement, um, which is sort of an illustration of the fact that um, 
everything there is floating up above that construction. This is called the Broadgate Exchange House, and if you're in London, you should go see it. This is the tie member, so this is that parabolic arch, and there's a tie member at the bottom that keeps it from spreading outward. Now, in addition to tall buildings, um, or, or fairly tall buildings, like 10 stories high and uh, needing to span, like the Federal Reserve Bank or the Broadgate Exchange House, we have numerous other situations that involve long span and structural challenges. Certainly athletic stadiums fall into that uh, category, but also um, many of the spaces that we design for airports, which we want to be grand spaces that are civic symbols, but also give people the feeling that they can breathe and that they can see how the building is organized and understand where they need to go. So this is the international terminal of the San Francisco airport, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. All these structures that I've been showing you uh, are driven either by practical architectural considerations or uh, the goal of structural efficiency. Sometimes we can be playful with structures and uh, for example we could start with this interlaced uh, triangular trusses which we do because it's beautiful and it's elegant and it's efficient and then we might just say something like what if we scaled it up and then tried to inhabit it now normally I don't advise people to do that because uh, I'm always reminded of Buckminster Fuller's story that um, if you were on a sinking ocean liner and you didn't have a lifeboat but you had a grand piano, you might think a grand piano would work pretty well as a lifeboat. Um, and it might save your life, on the other hand, if you were going to design a really good lifeboat, you wouldn't start with a grand piano. So I'm always a little skeptical with the notion that we're going to play games of this sort where we just ask, well, here's something, can we use it for something completely different? We have to really look at that and see. So here's an example though. Here we have these interlaced uh, trusses that create what we call a space frame. We can scale that up and turn it into a building. And this is the World Trade Center in Portland, Oregon. It's certainly nothing like the World Trade Center in New York, but it's, it's an absolutely exquisite little building where that space frame has been scaled up and then people are trying to inhabit it. So this is the entry level. You'll notice some escalators going up here and some stairs. And this is just a different view of those escalators. And so you go up inside this building and I can tell you that what originally excited me about architecture was the experiences I had as a child building tree houses. And this is, as a building, the closest thing I've ever experienced to the feelings that I had when I created tree houses. There's a great sense of, of just opportunity that you can move through all this structure and find a way to inhabit it. And it may not be the most efficient thing in the world, but the feeling that you get from that is a really incredible feeling. It's a very cool building. Okay, so that's a real quick scan through a bunch of examples of how structure is powerfully important, specifically in certain situations, such as high-rise buildings or long-span buildings. You're gonna to have to deal with structures in a lot of buildings that may not be as demanding as that, but you still need to think about structures and understand how to deal with them as a part of your design process. So I'm gonna hit four topics here that we're gonna deal with in ARC 331 and 332, and they are in order conceptualizing structures, how do we think about them and come up with ideas, then we're going to talk about guidelines for spans and proportions because once we uh, 
know that we're going to use a beam or a truss or a bow truss or whatever, we should understand what sort of proportions those things have and how far we can logically push them uh, in an economic way in order to make them work for us logically. Then we're going to talk about tables. Um, and this should have said tables for sizing standard structural spanning elements. And then finally we're going to talk about computer simulation tools that can be used to design some pretty simple things or immensely complicated things. So we'll start with conceptualizing structures and one of the themes we're going to deal with quite a bit in your structures class is the idea of mutually bracing sheets of material. And this may be at a, at a fairly small scale, like in the design of a beam, or it could be at the scale of a large building. So if we start with a little 16th inch sheet of styrene plastic and we try to turn it into a beam, it clearly doesn't work very well under its own weight it's sagging and collapsing through and if this person didn't have his finger under this it would have collapsed through so it's not working as a beam in that orientation so one of the things we learn is depth is important for your spanning member um, and so we take that same sheet of material and when we set it on edge where it's in a vertical plane it now can hold some load as not just its self weight but a little additional weight. One of the problems though with a thin sheet like this is the top part of this beam is in compression the bottom part's in tension but the, the top part's in compression and that part wants to buckle uh, under that load and the way it does is it just moves to one side or the other. We call that lateral buckling or lateral instability of the top of the beam and it starts to collapse over like that. Now we can take this three inch sheet of styrene and we can cut it into say three one inch strips and we can glue them together into an eye section or a wide flange design and now you'll notice that even though this is not as deep as that three inch sheet set vertically, in other words it's not as deep as that, it's holding a lot more weight and the reason is that each of these planes of material is bracing the plane to which it's attached. So for example, the top and bottom sheets of this are fairly strong horizontally. The center sheet, which we call the web, the top and bottom sheets we'll call flanges and the center piece we'll call the web member. The web member is in a vertical plane. It's strong relative to vertical forces. The other two are strong relative to horizontal forces and collectively they make a member that's working pretty well regardless of which way we load it. So this is an example of planes of structural material that are connected together in a manner where they reinforce each other's weak direction. So they're collaborating together in a collective uh, structural action. So this is the classic uh, steel section. This would be the top flange, the bottom flange, and the web. And this is often called an eye shape, although in modern uh, structures we'll call this a wide flange or uh, sometimes an M section, which means miscellaneous, but it's basically a wide flange section also classic example of mutually braced planes of material. Now we have other examples of this in architecture. For example, uh, these 2 by 10 joists, are, when they're set on edge like this, are very good at resisting vertical forces, but they tend to be laterally unstable. If we nail down plywood to the tops of those joists, they not only will help, not only will they support the plywood but the plywood will make them stronger because the plywood's diaphragm action stabilizes the tops of those beams. So the beams might want to buckle laterally in one direction or the other and the plywood helps resist it. So each of these 2x10s is in some sense a structural sheet of material and the plywood in the 
horizontal direction is another sheet of material and when we connect them together they both get a lot stronger. Classically in architecture we've had this notion of post and beam. Um, we have wood members of, of uh, finite length and we're tempted to put a beam on top of two columns one of the problems with this is that under lateral force um, the weakest part of the structure is the connection and that also happens to be where lateral forces produce the, the most deleterious effect. So post and beam structures have been classically not very successful particularly in wood where it's very difficult to get a tension connection there. So we'll often put something in here called a sniff stiff knee and in this direction the stiff knee would go into compression and would work pretty well but if we have it over on this side it'll be put in tension and typically our connections are not very good in tension when we're connecting pieces of wood together so post and beam was not a tremendously successful or very efficient structural system now we can make it work better here we have some two by fours that are being nailed together in the classic manner in which a building gets built, stick built, uh, wood frame building in this country. And this would be a wall. And here the, here the wall is initially straight. And now this person with one finger is pushing this wall over, which is kind of symptomatic of how bad these joints are. Because we got four joints down here and four joints up there. And, and those joints are so weak that this person is able to destabilize and collapse this wall with a single finger. Now we can nail a perpendicular sheet of material, in this case it's oriented strand board, which we use as sheathing and on stud walls like this. So if we nail it all the way around, you'll notice this person, even with all his strength, is not able to deform it significantly. And in fact, the major deformation you're seeing here is that this side is tending to lift up and that side push down. So we're developing some warpage in this beam at the bottom, but we're seeing almost no deformation uh, in this composite wall, which consists of two by four studs with oriented strand board nailed to them. Again, this, this is the concept of perpendicular sheets of material. So the studs are sheets that are perpendicular to the view plane, to the view direction. The oriented strand board is running in the opposite direction. And when they get nailed together, uh, they enhance each other's performance. Now, we've been talking about doing this kind of thing in the context of some studs in oriented strand board or in the context of perpendicular planes of material in a wide flange beam, but this concept applies to structures that we would build of any scale that we're capable of building. So if we took chipboard, for example, and we put a little spread footing on the base of this wall and we tried to push it over, it you can barely feel the force in your fingertip that's necessary to make that tilt over. Uh, so we say that wall is very weak perpendicular to the plane of the wall, but it could be fairly strong uh, for por forces parallel to the plane of that wall. So we could take more walls and connect them together at the corner. So this is the wall that was collapsing before. We put a couple of walls here that are perpendicular to it, connected at these points, and then we complete the enclosure with this wall and now all of a sudden we have to exert a much much larger force to get that wall to collapse inward. So here we have uh, this piece bracing that piece under this force and this piece bracing that piece. So the walls become uh, mutually braced planes of material. Uh, we can carry that concept one step further by putting a so-called diaphragm Roof. So these, by the way, are called shear walls. This one and the one on the other side. Under the influence of this force, they are transferring load down to the foundation through the shearing action in that wall. Um, the same kind of action is occurring in this plate 
which might be a roof or it might be a floor for all we know, but we call that a diaphragm, but we could also call this a diaphragm wall or we could call this a sheer floor, but the key point is that it's a cohesive plane of material that when we connect it to another perpendicular sheet of the same kind of material produces a much more stable structure. So now all of a sudden this wall is stabilized by the shear wall at each end, which would be this and the one on the other side, and it's also being stabilized along its upper edge by the diaphragm action of this sheet of material, which as I said, might be a floor or it might be a roof. Um, we can even use corrugated material like corrugated steel decking, which makes a very strong diaphragm in this direction. Uh, it's not quite so strong in that direction, but interestingly enough, we typically have material periodically that connects a whole series of these flutes, as we call them, together. So if we have a truss that runs all the way across the space and another one there, they're going to become substantially effective in keeping that wall from collapsing over. So this would be a, a sort of classic case where in the direction where we get this accordion deformation or the weakness in the roof diaphragm, uh, the roof diaphragm is now welded down at every one of these flutes there and there and there in there. So basically we're getting a very powerful diaphragm action out of this corrugated decking because we're using it in conjunction with the compressive capacity of the top cord member of these trusses. Okay, so let's talk about using various techniques to create stable planes of material to help create mutually braced planes of material. Here's a sort of flimsy structure that hasn't been articulated in a way where it's working particularly well, particularly under this lateral force of my finger. So we can stabilize that with shear walls and a diaphragm roof or roof and floor in this case. Um, these shear walls tend to have fairly small punched openings because the idea is, well, the wall works pretty well as a shear wall, but if we cut really huge wall holes in it, it's not really a shear wall anymore. So in most of our houses in this country, they're made out of stick-built construction, out like this. If you go cut giant holes in them, they don't work too well. So you'll find things in the code that'll say, on the top floor of the building, you can have such and such a percentage of the wall cut away for windows and the next floor down it's some smaller percentage and the next floor down it's an even smaller percentage but these are guidelines to keep you from decimating your shear wall and so the aesthetic of this ends up being this sort of punched opening aesthetic and just to be a little insulting I made these openings but to also to make a point I made these openings kind of small to remind you that you can't put huge gouges into your building and still expect it to work. So this is the concept of shear walls as a way of laterally stabilizing the building. We can also triangulate it. We can truss it in a whole host of different ways. Here we're showing cross bracing, but it can also be um, some other configuration. So this gives us light and possible ventilation through this wall, but probably not very good passage for people who might, you know, whack themselves on these cross braces. And this is the third concept. This is the so-called rigid frame, which allows a lot of light and cross ventilation and human circulation through the openings. So let's talk about this. Um, this can be used either on sort of low and mid-rise buildings. This is an example. This is a fairly complicated looking building, but if you strip away all the members that are not part of the lateral bracing system, this is what you have. So buried down in here, you have a triangulated frame right there, which we call a braced frame. And here's another braced frame right here. And then a couple of more in there. 
and I'm going to strip away everything that's not braced frame and that's what you end up with. And so this is a photograph of this building while it was under construction. You notice we didn't use cross bracing, we used this so-called chevron bracing because we wanted to have openings or doorways and we wanted to have as much flexibility as possible for people to move through those braced frames um, to maintain the architectural connectivity of the spaces. It's just another view of that building. Now we can do everything from sort of low-rise, medium-rise buildings of that sort up to something very tall like the John Hancock building which is basically cross-braced for stabilization. Now we also have moment frames and here is the Sears Tower which is based on that concept and this is what the, the moment frames look like in that building. Um, these are wide flange sections. These are actually welded up plate girders uh, that create the columns. The horizontals are made out of the same kind of material. We can do full penetration steel welding. So by the time they welded all these parts together you couldn't tell whether this material was the continuous material or whether this material was the continuous material. In other words, you couldn't tell what was there first, the verticals or the horizontals. These joints are all incredibly accurately welded. They're full penetration welds. Those are done in a shop, that one and that one. And then this whole strange cross structure is brought to the site and bolted here and there and there and there. So, and I should say there and there. So the field welding is done at the least critical locations, uh, excuse me, the field connections, and they're all bolted connections, and the really crucial connections at the joints, at the intersections of the members. They're welded, they're full penetration, and they're done under shop conditions. So this is what that rigid frame structure looks down at the base of the Sears Tower when you're just entering into one of the lobbies. A really beautiful structure and of course you know that's the old raw steel which is the structural stuff. This is then a really beautiful cladding of stainless steel. Some of it shiny and some of it brushed and it's really quite exquisite to see and also a beautiful experience to walk through it and understand how crucial it is uh, from a structural point of view. It looks very beautiful. It's very aesthetic. You'd almost feel like somebody deliberately designed it just for aesthetic reasons, but it was born out of really practical considerations of a structural nature. Okay, so perpendicular planes of material we were talking about earlier. Here we have a truss. So this truss can be thought of as a plane of material because it's a stable plane. It's fully triangulated. Here's another concept of a plane of material which is this wide flange beam or girder in this case. Um, so we have all those examples of perpendicular planes of material. Sometimes we have perpendicular planes of material without it being obvious because they're not really planes, they're more surfaces. So here we have a curved structural element which we call a barrel vault. It's fairly strong against forces along its length but it's really weak against lateral forces like this and this shape by the way under an asymmetric gravity load or under wind load um, we call roll through deformation roll through buckling is a common form of failure in barrel vaults. We can create perpendicular planes of material by taking two barrel vaults and intersecting them at 90 degrees to each other and then carving away all the material that would exist underneath each of those barrel vaults. This produces something we call a groin vault or a cross vault and these planes of material or these surfaces of material, sheets of material, are much more stable by virtue of the fact that they are at an angle where they tend to brace each other 
and they're connected together along this line or down in the groove. Sometimes, again, we, we have mutually braced planes of uh, sheets of material that flow into each other to such a degree that we don't conceptually separate them. But this is a dome. It's glued down around the perimeter. Uh, when it's pushed on laterally, it's a pretty stable structure. What's happening here, actually, is I'm pushing on this side of this, and this material wants to roll through like a barrel vault, but this material right here is acting like a shear wall, except instead of the simple cube that we might normally think of as architecture, the whole thing's been rounded off, so you can't, can't quite tell where the barrel vault stops and the shear wall starts, but those things work together really well. So here we have the other half of this basketball where we've cut away and we've left something that's approximately a barrel vault and we've removed the shear wall material from each side of it and now when we push on that it's an extremely weak structure. So a dome is an example of a shape which has, even though we don't see the the individual separate planes or sheets of material, they're, they're there and they are bracing each other very effectively. So a dome is an extremely efficient structural system. Okay, so that has to do with conceptualizing structures as mutually braced sheets of material. Now I want to talk about guidelines. And by the way, the first two of these things, the whole conceptualization of structures and then the application of guidelines for spans and proportions, these are things that you absolutely will do as architects. They're, they have almost no numbers associated with them, but they are profoundly important in terms of you being able to come up with a, a conceptually logical design that will accomplish the architectural goals that you have. So, guidelines for spans and proportions. Um, we use these to do preliminary sizing of standard structural elements. So, for example, uh, these are called parallel cord trusses because here's a bottom cord, there's a top cord, they're parallel to each other, they're very easy to make, they're very structurally efficient, they're very inexpensive. Um, they have some limitations though. You can't make them too shallow. So we'll have guidelines for how deep they can be uh, or how deep they need to be rather as a function of how far they're spanning. Likewise, this wide flange here has to have a certain amount of depth in order to be structurally efficient and logical and we will have guidelines for how deep it needs to be. So for in your book and in ARC 331, we'll have guidelines of the following sort that say if you have a simple span, meaning it's supported at each end, a simple span beam that's a wide flange steel beam, um, its depth can go as shallow as its length divided by 28, or might go deeper to L over 18. In some circumstances where you have enormously high forces, like if you were trying to do a transfer beam at the bottom of a understory building, you might even go deeper than L over 18. But in most practical applications, lightly loaded beams will be on the shallow end of a depth around L over 28. Heavily loaded beams will be more in the neighborhood of a depth that's at least equal to L over 18. So that's an example of a guideline. And by the way, for a wide flange beam, we're saying it's typical that they don't span over 80 feet. If you're going over 80 feet, you do something like a plate girder or a truss or something that you can make deeper. We don't roll these sections deep enough to go much beyond 80 feet. These are just practical concerns that you need to be aware of. So that if you want to span 200 feet, you don't say to your engineer, I'd like to do this with a wide flange beam because your engineer will think you're crazy because they don't roll deep enough wide flanges to do that. So likewise, we're going to have uh, guidelines for 
uh, a host of other things. Here are some trusses. This is this particular geometry is called a how truss. Typically, it'll span up to about 100 feet. We can push it beyond that, but it's usually not economical. And it gives the depth anywhere from its length over five to its length over four. Um, similarly, we have guidelines for fink trusses and things of that sort. So you're going to conceptualize your structure. It's going to contain some elements, some of which we hope will be common elements like parallel cord trusses or how trusses um, or, or wide flange beams. And these tables are going to allow you to figure out how far those things can span and how deep they need to be. And many of you will always be pushing to make things shallower and shallower, but that's not uh, a logical direction to be going in. Um, sometimes we can push technology further than these limits, but it's almost at some very substantial economic cost. Okay, so here are some parallel cord uh, girders. These heavy trusses are supporting the lighter trusses which sit on top of them, which are called uh, open web joists. And here are some more of those in a different configuration. So, all these things, we have guidelines for those. If we want to get even more accurate and more detailed information, we can use tables to size standard structural elements such as steel wide flange beams or steel trusses. And these are examples. We have standard tables that will allow you to size these for various spacings of the truss and various loadings on the seat on the roof or the floor that the trusses are supporting. And those tables look something like this and I'm not going to go through this in much detail except to say these are so-called the K truss series uh, for uh, steel trusses. K trusses are typically used in lightly load situations such as roofs. Um, they're designated with symbols like 18K6 18 is the depth in inches. K just tells us it's part of the K series trusses. And six is the designation for a certain weight of these. And that's not weight in pounds. That's just, uh, that's a technical number, but you can sort of scan along and see um, in this table how much load these trusses can weight, can hold. Or alternately, if we, you know how much load you have on the truss, you can go pick a truss from these tables, but you need to know your span and you need to know the load. And then this will actually give you the weight of that truss. We can do that for these joists and we can do it for the girders. So we have tables for both of those. And we also have tables for a so-called LH truss, which is the typical joist that we would use in a floor configuration. We'll define what all those things are and we'll show you how to use these tables and you'll be amazed how rapidly you can actually size your own structure once you understand how these tables work. Okay, so our final topic is using computer simulations and these can be used to size standard structural elements such as what we use for the tables. Uh, those tables typically are for simple span configurations, meaning they're just supported at each end. As soon as you go to something that's cantilevered, you probably need to either do some very detailed hand calculations or a computer simulation uh, because we can't publish tables that are extensive enough to deal with every kind of cantilever configuration that you might have. So these computer simulations are unbelievably powerful. They write out for you all the equations of interaction between every member that's connected to any other member. And you might in a structure end up with 100,000 or 500,000 simultaneous equations that need to be solved. 
Most of you remember from algebra how annoying it can be to solve a system of three simultaneous equations. Imagine having to do 50,000 of them. Our computer programs do that with unbelievably, unbelievable speed and amazing reliability. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, this is a parallel chord truss that has been analyzed and the size of this flag right here indicates the magnitude of the axial force in that member. So a deep flag means a large force, a shallow flag means a small force. In the top chord we have the smallest forces near the end, the largest forces in the middle. In the web members we have the smallest forces at the middle and the largest forces at the end. And you'll discover that these chord forces vary parabolically, so they don't just ramp up in a straight line. On the other hand, these web members do ramp up linearly, so this particular one is larger than that by a certain amount. This one is larger than that one by the same amount. So every time as we move a bay further out, we're adding the same amount of force to that diagonal member. Now we can take this material and we can reconfigure it. We can make it zero depth on the ends and some larger depth in the middle, which produces something like this bow truss. You'll notice the bow truss is deeper than this parallel cord truss, and so the forces have a better lever arm and the forces can be smaller. So the flags right here are a lot smaller than the flags right there. Uh, you'll also notice that in the bottom chord the forces are absolutely constant. In the top chord they're slightly larger here than they are there, but in general because the truss is deeper all these chord forces are lower than the worst chord forces there. So bow trusses are amazingly efficient for roof structures. They tend to be a little more expensive than parallel cord trusses, which is why you'll see a lot of this configuration supporting roughly flat roofs. You'll see more of those than you'll see of these bow trusses. Partly that's an aesthetic decision that many architects, for some reason, prefer the flat roof to the curved roof. Uh, partly it's a slight cost penalty associated with these bow trusses because they're a little bit more difficult to make. Not much, but a little bit. So these are all computer simulations that were done in a program called Multiframe. We describe the frame and its geometry. We attribute to every one of these members some kind of a section, which might be a steel angle or a steel double angle or a steel tube, or could be wood or something else. We did this in a program called Multiframe, and Multiframe has within its library every steel section that's rolled in the world. So you can go pick whatever section seems to work best for whatever structural situation you're dealing with. Okay, we can deal with some things, and by the way I should tell you this is not difficult to analyze by hand. This is not difficult to analyze by hand. So these are not examples where the computer has taken us from um, almost hopelessly difficult to easy. Um, this is where the computer has taken us from tedious and annoying to easy. Here's an example that goes from really, really difficult to analyze by hand to easy on the computer. This is an elliptical curved element, which we're tempted to call an arch. This arch, though, is not acting in pure compression, which we would like an arch to do. Because of its shape, it's tending to bulge outward that way, sag inward here, bulge outward there. The computer has actually simulated that deformation, which for us to do that by hand would take a good engineer about a month to do without the use of a computer. The computer does it in almost no time. It's probably drastically exaggerated here, but if this is a slender member, even this wouldn't be an exaggerated deflection. 
but the the beauty of the computer is it will exaggerate that deflection however much is necessary to help you visualize it so the computer wants you to understand that this thing is sagging in here so this was the original shape this is the deformed shape this is the original shape that's the deformed shape and when you see these deformations it communicates a great deal to you about the behavior of the structure and where it might not be working very well and what you might be able to do to fix it. So in this case, by the way, this structure is also showing something we call bending stresses. Um, and we would like an arch to be just axial compression, but in fact we have bending stresses here that are really extreme. And these bending stresses here and there drastically exceed the axial stresses. In other words, this is really not acting like an arch at all. It's acting like a beam or we sometimes call it a rigid frame, which is has induced within it enormous bending stresses. So we should never call this an arch. We should call it a rigid frame and understand that the bending stresses are going to be very large. Okay, so we have a structure that's trying to bulge out there, bulge out there, sag in here, so we might want to do something like this. So the green here, at least this upper green, represents the original shape. Now we're putting a tensile sling here and a tensile element around there. Um, and this is to help hold this in against bulging out. This is to help hold it up against collapsing inward. This is there to keep it from bulging out. So this is the modified version. This is the original version. And when we go analyze it, we discover that when we truss it, like in the figure up above, we drastically reduce the amount of deflection. In other words, we're thickening this thing to help it get stronger where it was having the biggest problems. And if you'd like to see a really beautiful example of this concept, this is the Berlin train station. This is the original elliptical form that they started with. And then they've put these tension elements on the outside to stop the bulging outward and a tension element here to help keep it from collapsing inward. And those tension elements, by the way, are so delicate, they're even really difficult to see. But here's one set right there. And then on the outside, Here's the set that's stopping the outward bulging. So these people basically said, we think this is a really cool shape, but what we think is even more beautiful is we're basically going to make our building like a moment diagram, and the structure is going to communicate to us exactly how it's behaving. It's a language of structures, which is really producing a really beautiful form. And by the way, some people prefer this elliptical version to the proper parabolic form because the proper parabolic form has a lot of slope here and doesn't give you headroom and doesn't give a pleasing space whereas this ellipse starts off essentially vertical in that zone and gives you a much nicer architectural expression uh, although it does so at the cost of all this additional material. Uh, that additional material costs money but it also has a very beautiful expression. Okay, so we can analyze other things. This would represent a truss, which is cantilevering past this point and that one. So there's a support point. There's a support point. This is showing where we have compression in the top cord, where we have compression in the bottom cord, over the supports and out towards the tip of the cantilever. So blue represents tension. Yellow represents compression. That's a very beautiful expression of what's going on in the structure. Um, this is a building that I worked on a while back and we actually designed this building by just tweaking the geometry and multi-frame. Um, so this is a kind of a rasterized image. This is a fairly old project and uh, the computer on which I did it uh, was not a very fine-grained image. 
Um, but the analysis was quite good. Um, it's just the computer wasn't graphically up to snuff, but this was the structural geometry. Um, here we have, uh, in this case, bending stresses and axial stresses for all the members in the roof. And I went through and tweaked all of these members uh, to get a really good balanced design by the time we got done. Okay, so the final topic I want to talk about, which all of you should deal with at some point, and much more so than is currently done in the architecture profession, is the whole idea of integrating uh, structure with other design issues and other subsystems. So for example, in a floor, we have something called the interstitial volume, which contains things like structure and ducts and um, uh, electric lights and conduit and things of that sort. So here's the design paradigm that we've had for the last 80 or so years since we had good electric lighting for buildings. It's actually probably more like 90 years now. Um, the team gets together and they say, well, we think we're going to have such and such a column span. And they look at the structural engineer and they say, how deep your structure need to be? And the structural engineer specifies this dimension. And typically from that moment on to avoid excessive coordination, this volume right here belongs to the structural engineer. And then they look at the ductwork guy who figures out how long the duct runs are and how much space is being thermally conditioned. And the duct guy says, well, I need ducts that are such and such a size. And from then on, this dimension, or this volume rather, belongs to the HVAC designer. And then the electrical person has electric lights. Uh, and in fact, these fixtures not only can be very deep, but they really need clearance underneath the ducts because we often have to lift these up and move them around above the hung ceiling, which means we need to get them over these aluminum tees, which are typically an inch and a half deep. So we need like two or three inches of clearance between the duct and the electrical devices, which should be reflected as more of this yellow volume. So that's how we've done design, which I don't think of it as design integration. I think of it as uh, and it's not design coordination or systems coordination. It's uh, basically allocating volume to each of those individual systems. Now, I like to think that we can do better than that. And here's an example of how we can. We can design our duct system so it integrates with the structure. So this building started off with a deep girder truss down the center and then girder trusses here and over there and this bay was roughly 60 feet. And in the design of this building, I looked at this center girder and I realized it was about the same weight as two of these perimeter girders. So I suggested we just take that girder and make two girders and we separate them. So we have an additional set of columns that we had to pay for, but in the process of doing that, we created this uh, volume down the center line, which worked really well as a corridor. And because the roof structure only has to span about 10 feet here, we were able to do it with nothing more than whatever the depth of the end bearing assembly was of the truss. In other words, there's a little five inch deep wide flange beam there that spans that distance that allowed us to put this huge HVAC trunk line duct uh, in the ceiling of that corridor space. And then we were able to run these feeder ducts between the joist trusses here. So in essence, we have uh, handled our entire HVAC system within the depth of the structural system. You'll also notice, by the way, in this case, I span the 60 foot direction with the joist and then the girder is only 30 feet, um, partly because the girders are more heavily loaded and I wanted to use a shorter span to improve their efficiency, but also there was going to be parking under this building. 
which means we needed columns that were spaced at least 60 feet in this direction, but we didn't need a 60 foot spacing in that direction. So down below, there is a carter for uh, vehicles to move in this direction, and then they park there, or they peel off and park here. And so there's a 60 foot wide space to handle double loaded parking. So this is an example of integrating ducts and structure in the flooring volume, in the interstitial volume. Another example is the Sears Tower. The Sears Tower uh, has trusses that are spanned, every, they uh, are spaced 15 feet on center. So here's a column back behind that wall and uh, it has trusses attached to it. And then there's another column right next to it right here which has trusses spanning into the space. Um, none of the horizontal spandrel elements on this building support any gravity load. They're just part of the lateral bracing system. So when we go inside this building, every 15 feet you have a column like this. It's part of this rigid frame structure. And all the trusses up above get delivered down through these columns. So there are no girder trusses. They're just joist girders, joist trusses that deliver their loads directly to the columns and then those columns carry those loads directly to the ground. So this is a plan view by the way of this building with a truss every 15 feet, the truss landing on the column. Uh, in order to have all these columns share load, some of the trusses run this way, some of them run that way, and they actually change the direction of the trusses every five stories uh, to assure a good distribution of load. Because the trusses were widely spaced and because they were spanning 75 feet of free span, the trusses were fairly deep, they were fairly widely spaced, and the designers were able to run the ductwork through the trusses without it becoming too complicated. If the, truss work, if the trusses are 15 feet apart, the duct installers can easily get the ducts up there. If your trusses are four feet apart, they'll just throw up their hands in despair. Here's another interesting little fact. This, the people at SOM who designed the Sears Tower wanted these trusses every 15 feet. That meant they needed to have decking that would span 15 feet, and there was no such decking at that time available. So they put out a call for somebody to manufacture three inch deep steel corrugated decking. And when you're doing a building as big as the Sears Tower, people line up to offer to develop the rolling equipment to do that. So today we have as a standard item, three inch corrugated decking, which we owe to this design, which pushed the technology to get us to do that. Another example of systems integration is in the roof of the building, integrating structure ducts and daylighting. Um, sometimes we put the trusses below. So this is a building that I worked on years ago. The building already existed. The trusses were there. We just peeled away part of the roof and put this roof monitor on. And so the building looks something like this. This was not the most efficient way to do this structure because there was a whole lot of lateral bracing up there. But the people who lived in this building really loved the daylighting because this was like a dark dungeon office before we tore away the, the hung ceiling, which was quite low, and exposed all the structure and then tore away part of the roof and put the roof monitor on it. And ever since then, it's been this really light, airy space. We could have done more efficiently by using V-shaped trusses like this, and I showed you some of those earlier in this lecture. Um, this is a model we built a few years back based on interlaced V-shaped trusses or so-called um, space frame structure. Here we see some blue ducts being installed and we can put a cowling inside there to um, cover up the ductwork or provide fireproofing for the structure and this is what it looks like after all those cowlings are installed. So this is a beautifully integrated system that has a place for ductwork, it has a place for structure, and it allows daylight to get into this space 
in a really wonderful way. This, by the way, is a scale model um, and not the actual architecture. We can put trusses in the daylighting apertures, and that's a way of getting much greater structural depth and structural efficiency. So here's an example. Um, this sawtooth roof has these trusses in this vertical plane, uh, and they are the primary support for the roof. And these are um, not really structural beams at all. They're there for uh, including electrical systems and some of the electric lighting and to cover up the bottom cords of these trusses. Here's another example. Here we have north and south glazing in this truss, which is south facing, and that truss on the other side, which is north facing. And this is with the roof surfaces up on the upper level roof surfaces alternating with lower level to provide the apertures which occur through these trusses. And by the way, these trusses can be made so efficiently that they have substantially less than a 10% effect on the daylighting penetrating through the aperture. Here's just another graphic of that kind of roof. And here's one more example, and I'll finish off with this. Here we have some really deep trusses. Um, then we have a horizontal roof on the top of the trusses. We have a sloped roof for the lower roof in between. And it's sloped to allow water runoff on the top. And you'll notice there's a tapered volume that gets deeper at the boundary of the building, which is what we want because water will accumulate as it runs off the roof. So we have a tapered volume that's deep where we want it to be. Down below that roof surface, we have a tapered volume that we can use to uh, transport uh, thermally conditioned air or just air for fresh air purposes. That volume is also tapered and it's exactly the way you want it because if this is at the, the core of the building and air is being delivered here, that volume can afford to get thinner and thinner uh, as, as air is bled off of it. So that's one geometry where we have a certain amount of vertical rise to the slope surface. That slope surface is typically going to be at a quarter of an inch vertical per foot horizontal. Um, we'll have an even deeper truss if we want to do a 60 foot span because we'll have twice as much vertical rise for this uh, slope surface. And so this represents our tapered uh, air volume going from this end down to the perimeter of the building. Here we have our tapered water volume for getting water off of the roof. So we have an extremely deep and very efficient truss, which uh, is accommodating water runoff, um, daylighting, uh, air ducts, everything all very well integrated into uh, a very compact and effective roofing, roofing system. Okay, so that gives you kind of an overview of, of uh, the kind of structural thought processes we're going to go through and the kinds of things that you're going to learn. Um, and you'll start some of that process in ARC 232 uh, with Professor Gulling and then it will expand in ARC 331 and ARC 332. And this is just a quick overview, which we're providing to you as part of your introduction to architecture.